Hello and welcome to Reservoir Red Dogs. I'm Matt Ford and as always I'm joined by... I've done it again. <laughs> Most of the time I'm joined by Paul McGregor. I wasn't last time but this time I am once again joined by the woman. Hi mate, you're right. Paul, we missed you last time. I missed you guys too. Everything okay? It's alright, yeah. I was up in Scotland. Oh, lovely. Yeah, a few beach walks and got out in the woods. Just hanging out in the woods. Walking dogs. Right. <laughs> Doing stuff. Scottish stuff. You'll know. I know, yeah. <laughs> John knows. What, when yeah. you say Scottish stuff, what Scottish do you mean? Stuff. Just Eating haggis? Totty scones. Yeah. Totty scones. Yeah. Whoa. Caper all the, tossing? All the stuff, yeah. Kill oh, the Squ- Square sausage, yeah. Square I love sausage. A square sausage. Yeah. Head butting. Yeah. <laughs> a wee dram. <laughs> oh, a lovely bit of whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. We should we should have a little away day, the lot of us. Because I suppose it was like hey, New York first. We've got to do New York first. Uh, you would have mid-season breaks, wouldn't you, as a player? You'd go to Callum and Law with Cluffy. Yeah, they, they were pretty much things of the past, I think. They were for the our generation, the mid-season breaks, I think. And we used to have them every year, every, <laughs> every weekend. And enjoyed them, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Good well, time. The, the, well, I shall ask you about them in, in, in due course. The voice you can hear, of course, is uh, a forest legend, John O'Hare, is our guest today. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here, John. Uh, John O'Hare's nickname is Solly. Yeah. What does that? What, what does the, Where does that come from? It goes back an awful long time. It goes back to primary school, and there was a little ditty, uh, say Solomon Grundy, born on Monday, yes, Christmas on Tuesday, married on Wednesday, took care on Thursday, was Friday, died Saturday, buried on Sunday, and that was the end of Solomon Grundy. <laughs> well, the teacher used to ask me on a regular basis to get up and give it Solomon Grundy. So eventually. People at the schoolmates, kids school, uh, started calling me Solomon. <laughs> Got shorted to Solly. And I'm and people used to come and knock my door and is Solly coming out to play? And my mother used to get really annoyed. His name is John. <laughs> and uh but actually followed me all I, I left Scotland nineteen sixty two to go to Sunderland and uh the I became John again. So the year after I went to Sunderland, a little I called Bobby Kerr who captain Sunderland when they won the cup in 73. He came down and he lived just up the road from me, so he knew me as Solly. So I became Solly again. So then I moved to Derby in 1967, uh, became John again for a while. Then Colin Todd came a year after and I became Solly again. <laughs> so it followed me around and by the time I got to Forest, most people knew me as Solly. And it was as simple as that, Solomon Grundy. It was... Uh, there was an article in the paper once about Canario del Sol, Real Madrid, let me get it right here. The press guy thought it was maybe something to do with the way I play, a bit like del Sol, <laughs> and there was nothing at all to do with it. And here we are in 2018 still talking about Solly. Solly, yeah, yeah. Most people, I remember if we went abroad to play our, I mean, American tours, uh, there was always people from Scotland who would turn up, and I could hear the, in the crowd, Solly. And I knew they know me, you know, so it was, it was a really good feeling. Oh, well, it's cool. You're from Renton in Western Barnsley, which yeah. is just near the southern tip of Loch Lomond, yeah. beautiful part of the world. I've been through it a couple of times. It's a lovely yeah. place. Yeah. Um, well, so it's, about, uh, it's a 10 minute walk to Loch Lomond, 15 minute walk to oh, Loch lovely. Lomond. So that was the good part of it. Just yeah. near Cameron House. The lovely yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the, so yeah. Scottish stuff. Oh, Scottish stuff's cool. Mm. Yeah. And there were a lot of Scottish players at Forest when, when you were at Forest. I, mean, I was going to do things chronologically, but there was, there was obviously you, Kenny Burns, Rob Owen, Frank Gray. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. strong Scottish contingent. Yeah, there was, yeah. There was, at, yeah, yeah, Forest. yeah. Um, John McGovern. John of course, John McGovern as well. Yeah. Montrose, yeah, yeah. John was born in Montrose, I think, so. It's always funny with John, because I know he's Scottish, but his accent is less pronounced. I have no, I have no idea what his accent is. <laughs> it sounds almost Geordie sometimes. Yeah, well, he grew up in Hartlepool. So that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that's that mystery song. Yeah. But, he, but he, if you ask him, he's Scottish. Uh, your first club was Sunderland. Yeah. Uh, you were there from 64 to 67. And uh, this is remarkable given how much time you then spent with him uh, as a player under his uh, leadership. Played with Brian Clough. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say I played with him. I'd, I'd play in a training ground with him. I, I never actually played a first team game or anything like that with him. Uh, my, I think it was my second season at Sunderland. Uh, I went... As a young lad, 15 going on 16, 62, 63. And Boxing Day 63, he got the injury that finished his career. Were you at that game? Yeah, I was at the game, yeah, yeah. Boxing Day against Bury. And he went through a through ball, he went for it. The keeper came out, he went over the keeper. Uh, obviously a bad knee injury. These days, it certainly wouldn't have finished his career. But in those days, I suppose it was pretty serious and finished his career. 
And did you know him to talk to back then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He knew him to talk to, yeah. And what was he like with you? What was he like dealing with a, a, well, a junior was, player? Well, it was... Uh, just as everybody knows him, he was quite an arrogant. He used to breeze into training. Wasn't I, I wouldn't say he was the most popular guy in the in the team, you know, but he scored so many goals they they had to put up with him. But he, he was uh just one of his his arrogance, his belief, his confidence, whatever you want to call it, he had it as a player. But he scored so many goals, he was entitled to have it. He was just an amazing goal scorer. His goal scoring record is is outstanding. Amazing. And it's yeah. something that still stands. What about his overall game? Was he was he a good, well rounded all round? I would say he was a decent player, but I wouldn't say by any means a great player. He was all he, he played through the middle, he got in the box, he was a good striker of the ball, and he was pretty brave, and he just loved scoring a goal. Uh, probably a bit selfish in a way, but uh, not technically a, a great footballer, but knew where the goal was and a really like hit the target most times. A, a, a little bit like Harry Kane these days. He hits the target and that's yeah. what Cluffy he used to hit the target nine times out of ten. Do you find the arrogance is something that centre forwards should have? Do you think that's? Do you think it's not necessarily needed, but do you think it it can help a centre forward? Well, I think it probably does help. Paul. I think it probably helps that the fact that he was so thick-skinned about anyone trying to criticise him. He just like numbers, you know, forty goals a season, almost for about five or six seasons. So you can afford to be a bit thick. You know, people might criticise you. Other players might think he's not doing his you know, maybe what he should be doing. But at the end of the day, he scored the goals that's won them the game. So, yeah, it can be pretty helpful, I think. I mean, I never I never scored that many goals to be that sort of man again, do I? Well, it's interesting because you both strike. Cluffy was a strike and you both were as well. Would you describe yourself as having as, as having a healthy amount of arrogance in your playing days? Well, health. I think health is a, a, a good word because you've, you've got to have the utmost belief I can remember seeing, a, um, obviously, I apologise, I'm growing up a Liverpool fan. Um, I used to have a John Barnes uh, video that I used to watch religiously. And he, I can remember him saying, when I was a young kid, um, that if, you, um, if you're not walking out on that pitch thinking that you're the best player on the pitch, you've got no business being there. Yeah. So, you, you, particularly as a centre forward, you get, to, you get to a stage, especially when you're scoring goals, where you, just, you know you're going to score. You know when it comes to you, you, you're the one that wants it in the last minute. Yeah. Give me the ball. It's going to hit the back of it. If it comes to me, it's hitting the back of that net. That's a fact. That's happening. And you, you, that builds in you. Balancing that in your everyday life is, is, is another thing because you don't, want to, you don't want to translate that level of arrogance into being in the pub. Well, I'm going to make the best cup of tea. I'm going to make yeah. the best ham sandwich. I am clearly the best dressed in this pub. But you probably would have been as I well. Would, I would have been. Yeah. <laughs> So John, was arrogance part of your makeup as a player? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that really, no, but uh, talking about a striker, probably arrogance is a good thing to have a goal scorer, but I always considered myself a midfield player playing up front. I was actually going back to the old, an inside forward or a wing half, so that's what I started my career doing that. And then uh, when Brian Clough got injured, he started taking youth cup, the youth cup team to, you know, he sort of took charge of him and uh, did the training with him and he stuck me up front as a ty- type of target man uh, centre forward and I always felt I don't, you probably won't remember these guys but I wanted to be Bobby Murdoch who played for Celtic a right half he was my you know that was the person I wanted to be play as a footballer so I didn't really ever really consider myself as a, a centre forward but I was stuck up there and as it happened it, it was okay. I, my career went quite well. <laughs> my career went very well. You were at Sunderland for three years, including in 1967, playing for Vancouver Royal Canadians over in America. But Vancouver Royal Canadians were just Sunderland by another name playing in an American tournament. How did that come about? Well, it was when they were trying to get uh, soccer off the ground in the <laughs> USA. And uh, we were, Sunderland were chosen to represent Vancouver Royal Canadians. Uh, probably, oh, maybe it would be the best drinkers in the in the tournament. <laughs> I would uh, people like Jim Baxter, George Canell, George Mulhall. I think we'd have won that comfortably. Uh, but that was the way it was. And Puskis was actually the manager when, That's right. uh, wow. yeah, yeah. But I, we just we'd only been there a day, and he got the sack. So, uh, <laughs> but Vancouver, what a beautiful, beautiful place it is. Uh, we didn't do particularly well. It was a bit like a going on a stag do for about a couple of months. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm like people like Jim Baxter they were uncontrollable you know the managers they just had a great time really football 
like the first game we played away, we lost six one. I think we played twelve games and maybe won one. <laughs> oh, uh, I think we beat Shamrock Rovers maybe or something like that. But uh, but it was it was a really good time. You know, not in the right way. But would this take place in lieu of a pre-season, or, or was this during the season? It was no, it was it was during the summer time. Yeah, it was during the summer. Yeah, I mean, Wolves were there. They were in uh, Washington, I think. Hibs were in Toronto. There's quite a few English. Didn't British Aberdeen. Clubs. Aberdeen were there. Were they a team? What were they called? They went out. They might be Washington. They were Washington, I think. Aberdeen. I've got a feeling. They, called, they had a nickname. Uh, well, what, Washington Whips. We were Vancouver Whips, Royal Canadians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, but we were just yeah representing Vancouver, and we didn't do very well. But I uh, met a few good people, Little Richard, Brenda Lee, cool. Stevie Wonder. You met Little Richard? Yeah, yeah. Went party with Little Richard, yeah. yeah. Well, so what was that like? It oh. was, I, can't really, I can't really talk too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was good though, yeah. He wouldn't yeah. mind if you told us yeah. a few tales, was it? Was it what, sort of late nights? And well, was it, he'd been going to watch with Cabri and he was staying in the same hotel as us. Brilliant. So we sort of went back to his room and uh, had a few beers with him and uh, Jim Baxter just... Let him know that he thought Sinatra was a bit better. <laughs> Jim was a Sinatra fan, but uh, Little Richard was really good. Really oh, good. man. He was a very, very friendly guy. Uh, so 67 is also the year that, that Clough signed you for, for Derby County. Yeah. This is when things really start to take off. Uh, and obviously with, with him, you won the second division, the first division, uh, the Texaco Cup and the Watney Cup. Uh, they should not go unmentioned. <laughs> um, so in between being signed by Clough and, ha- and having played with him, had you kept in touch in those intervening years? No. No, no, no. You wouldn't have, so it wasn't expected? Away from football, no, never. Really, no. Uh, he, came, he came up to Sunderland uh, quite out of the blue, really. Uh, him and Peter Taylor came up, and I'd been actually been transfer listed not long after we got back from America. For uh, some disciplinary reasons, but uh, <laughs> so what sort of disciplinary? Uh, reasons? Well, that wasn't that wasn't about the trip to America, but that may have had a little bit to do with it. Uh, I just had something. I put something in a newspaper column, and you weren't supposed to do that without uh, official the club uh, letting you do it. Yeah. But was it critical of the club? It was a little bit critical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Ian McCall, who was the manager then, Scottish guy, he put me in the transfer list and. Uh, a couple of days later, Clough and Taylor came up to see me, and just I don't know. I just knew he'd be a good manager. Yeah, yeah you, you can't say for sure, obviously, but I had the feeling that the guy was driven. Like, and he, in the, while he'd been taking the youth team, while I'd been part of that, he, he, his training was different. His, you know, he was he was breath of fresh air, really. You know, so like I didn't particularly want to leave Sunderland, but off I go. Yeah. So you go to Derby with Clough, and this is where the Clough revolution really starts to happen and the success starts to come relatively quickly. Uh, there's been so much written about that time at Derby, about the influence of Sam Longson and the breakdown of that relationship. How difficult was it? Because the players put, you know, signed a letter and, and got the local media and wanted Clough and Taylor back. Did you ever think at any point that that decision would be reversed and that they would return, or was it all a bit forlorn? I think it was all a bit forlorn. Looking back on it, no, I never really thought it was going to happen. Uh, Sam Longson was a very stubborn man. I think it was a personal fallout, and they weren't going to uh, be friends again. You know, they certainly weren't going to get together again. So I, I didn't think it would ever happen. No, but I suppose in a way, it's quite, um, quite special that that's part of the history that people felt so strongly about Brian Clough that even the, I can't imagine any football club now players right, you know, organising like a union would. Uh, to try and get a, a manager back, or, or the or the public reacting in that way. I mean, but any of the clubs you played at, Paul, w- would you have ever <laughs> signed a petition to keep a manager, maybe apart from Brian Clough? No. <laughs> well, there you go. That's it. <laughs> Shows you how, how special and rare that was. Um, <laughs> we're not going to dwell on the Derby days too much, of course, because it's a Forest podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, seven years later, uh, Clough ends up at Leeds United. And uh, as the um, as many people have documented, he takes you and, and John McGovern with him. Yeah, uh, he only lasts forty four days. So, firstly, in terms of him signing you and McGovern, he obviously had a p- particular affinity with you and was was very fond of you um, as a oh, player. Very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as a person, was... did you feel that you were his favourite or that he had a soft spot for you? No, too? not at all. No, no, no. Well, I'll just give you an instance. When I was at Derby, I mean, I'd probably played about I don't know. Somewhere around three hundred games, but there was no. Uh, when he eventually left me out, Roger Davis had, uh, was coming through, scored a lot of goals and reserves. 
And in those days, like the team sheet went up on a Friday afternoon after training, Friday lunchtime. And if you just go and look at the team sheet to see if you're playing. So I think they were playing Arsenal at home, uh, probably, I don't know how many games into the season. So I go and look at the team sheet and I'd be left out. Never said a word, never said, like, I'm leaving you. And just like, as cold as that, you know, <sighs> that was it. And uh, then Roger actually got in the side then, did quite well. Then I sort of played a bit in midfield then, which I quite enjoyed actually, yeah. But like, yeah, no, uh, no sympathy whatsoever. No, there was nothing, no sympathy for being. And you're left all in. looking at it together, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go look at your the team sheet. Goes up, like reserve team coach comes in or whoever oh, comes man. up, just pins it up, and you're all huddled round. And you, ah, you're not playing. We had loads of that. I think I think the worst thing about like I've, I've got to go home and tell my wife now. I'm not yeah. playing tomorrow, you know. <laughs> so that was probably the hardest bit. Yeah, handling it though, just emotionally, is it hard to take? Ah. Uh, well, it's, it's certainly deflating when it's, it's first happens. Right? It. Yeah, first, yeah. when it first happens, yes. And uh, but obviously you're not playing that well, and you probably know you're not playing that well. You've got a younger lad in the reserves who's really doing well. He's had a couple of games in the Texaco Cup or whatever, and uh, so yeah, it was it was going to happen, and uh, it was pretty difficult at first. I've got to say, yeah. So having gone through that, was it then a, quite a surprise that he signed you for Leeds? Uh, not really, because I could play in the middle of the park as well. You know, I was, I, when they signed me for Leeds, Leeds, ugh, probably the greatest team in Britain over that period of, you know, four or five, six years. And, and when he signed me, he said, I'm signing you really as a, a backup squad sort of type of player. But the money was better, so I just went because I was getting paid better. As simple as that. So the it, was, it was simply for the money, yeah. So the, the, I mean, the, there's so much written about Clough's arrival at Leeds. Uh, and particularly the speech that he gives to the Leeds players, you can take all your pots and all your pans and chuck them in the nearest effing dustbin because yeah. you're one of all by cheating. Were you there at that moment? No, I wasn't there at that moment. No, no, but it was it was true. He did actually, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I soon realised they'd only been there like a week or so, and uh, they just were not going to have them. The player, I mean, I knew all the Scottish players. I'd played for Scotland with Billy Bremner, Peter Lorimer, Eddie Gray, so, and uh, but the. There's just an atmosphere that they were not going to entertain him, and he wasn't going to be there very long. Uh, we were wondering whether he got him to buy a house in Leeds. We went and had a look, and I think I actually put a deposit down. Maybe, maybe I didn't. I can't remember now. But then I said to my wife, he, "He'll not be here very long." <laughs> but now, you know, but it was just one of those things. I've got, I've got, I haven't got a bad word to say about Leeds. The lads were fine. There was no problem whatsoever. Uh, Jimmy Armfield came in, who is an absolute gentleman. Uh, terrific block and I didn't really have a problem just one of those things that didn't work you know so, so the rest of the squad didn't see you as Clough's mole or Clough's boy not really no, no, there was no, no hostility towards you from no, those no, people no I never no never never got that at all no I was absolutely fine with all the players I think all really good guys well from what I knew of them I, I got to know them fairly well yeah have you seen so, the Damn United yeah, yeah yeah what did you think that was fairly accurate oh okay a little bit of you know a little bit here and there may not have been quite spot on but generally fairly accurate yeah wow okay. what's it like seeing someone play you on screen uh, I, I can't remember who it was now I think it was a Scottish lad was it yeah, yeah. Martin yeah. Comston Martin Comston yeah. 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 so how I mean to get somebody like him playing me on screen yeah yeah have you who's, met who's him a, have you met Martin no but Johnny's told me all about him I don't, I've not, never actually met him but he became a really his profile of me got him really really good jobs didn't it who would and play films. you Matt oh god I don't know, I'm trying to think of someone fat in Who played? James Corden. James Corden, yeah. <laughs> who's, who's he got to play? James Corden, the guy who used to play uh, Fred Elliott and probably play it. <laughs> <laughs> who's playing <laughs> I need to shift the weight. That is cold. It's causing me psychological trauma. Cold, um, who'd play you in a film then? Oh. This is so cool because this is the sort of question, this is like dinner party question, isn't it? Who would play you in a film? Yeah. You've had it. And yeah. it's Martin Comston. But at that time, he probably wasn't that well-known, Martin Comston, but he became uh, but, pretty big, right? He oh became pretty God. big, yeah, yeah. It's so cool. It's really cool, mm. isn't it? It's only sort of dawned on me how amazing it was. Yeah, been. that started him. That started his career. Of that course. set it off. <laughs> wow. So who would play you? Uh, Maka. You must Probably thought. River Phoenix in his prime. Okay. <laughs> so you're talking about people I, I wouldn't even know them if I bumped into them. <laughs> oh, uh, River Phoenix... No longer with us. Yeah, probably now. River Phoenix now. Troubled Soul. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. I'll tell that's you. A, that's a, that's Brad good... Pitt. Brad Pitt for Macca, surely. Brad Pitt for Macca, Johnny oh. Owen says. I tell you what. 
But everyone says Brad Pitt. That's what I was going to say. It's the sort of name that stuck me, Brad Pitt. (laughs) I often get called Brad Pitt. But but wouldn't you... Well, rhyming slang, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Would you... uh, You want someone brooding, don't you? Like Paddy Considine. Um, Why? Am I a a brooder? Get the ball up to me up front. I'll be that far away from slitting your neck. You want to have like a dark... Dead man's (laughs) shoes meets... Anyone that's ever played against me knows that that is not mine. Dead man's boots. Oh, yeah. Could be about the Leon goals. Oh, I better score tomorrow, mate. We well, better get in that car and f off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's getting bleeped, isn't it? <laughs> that was good. Yeah. <laughs> My palms are sweating. That was good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was good. Channel it when I need to. Felt um, threatened. So the 44 day, what was it like? That, would Clough ever say to you during that brief period at Leeds, would he ever say to you, bloody hell, John, <laughs> it's not going so well? <laughs> or, or, you know. In a better, more clubby yeah, voice. Yeah, that was Fred Elliott, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> His actual Ash voice. <laughs> he knew. He knew. He, when he used to take training, uh, people weren't really doing it for him, you know. The, 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 yeah. the, the Leeds players uh, made it quite clear, I think, without, not vocally, but even yeah. in training sessions that, you know, they, they like just weren't bothered. Honestly, it was like, there's a, there's a guy called Sid Owen. Sid Owen was one of the trainers, Sid to kill. Uh, at that time for a while and like Cluffy was actually saying Sid Owen didn't like him well he didn't like him neither you know so they, 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 they had no chance whatsoever and Sid Owen used to make it as difficult for him as he could as well uh, so there was a whole uh, the whole squad of players and staff made it as difficult for him as possible and it, honestly it's understandable because he went in like a bull at a gate really and the things that he said uh, were just ridiculous and he didn't like Leeds he didn't like Don Revy so, how he ever got the job, really, I don't it's know. It's a great story, isn't it? It's Why amazing. would you go? How he, how he got the job? Why but did he... Uh, it's kind of only amazing because of what happened next. It's yeah. amazing because he then was capable of achieving great things yeah. at a smaller club. Had that been the end of Brian Clough, it, it would be a, it would be a very yeah. sad yeah, tale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing precursor to phenomenal success. Um, I had a stab at a Cloughy impression then. Michael Sheen's in the film is... Uh, astonishingly good pretty good I'd say yeah, yeah, uh, a lot yeah. of people who play for Clough can do John McGovern does a does very good quite well, yeah, yeah. can you do him? no not at all Scottish I, I can't do a Scottish Clough no, no. I like uh, as we've discussed before I like the yo <laughs> yeah. I love that <laughs> and you your lot yeah. directors yo. directors wives <laughs> and hangers on is that something you get sort of aggressive towards uh, the end of the <clears> sentence <throat> um, he then signs you for Forest in 1975 and you're part of this remarkable success story. Um, at that point then, you've, you've been with him at Leeds, you've seen how things can go wrong for him. When you signed for him in 75, did you have any hint at all about what was to come? No, not at all, no. When, when we got uh, John McGovern and I obviously came at the same time, and uh, he's, he, that was probably the only time in his career in football that I, I sort of think he lost his confidence a little bit, he lost his belief a little bit, he wasn't quite the same person. Uh, Bear in mind he got to Leeds by himself, without Peter Taylor it might have been different if Peter had been with yeah. him. Uh, so when he came to Forest, I, I just didn't think he was the same man, to be very honest. And I think it really only happened when Peter Taylor uh, joined him again. And I think then he got his, he got it back again. So what was he like be- before Taylor arrived? How had he changed? Was he was he more modest? Was he less vocal? Was he less intense? He was, yeah. He was less vocal, less intense. Uh, yeah, he, more modest, if you believe. Yeah, it really was. He, he did. He, he was a bit quieter. Yeah, it's really hard to imagine him. Yeah, like yeah. That. It, it, it is hard to imagine. Yeah, but he certainly did. And Peter Taylor definitely uh, had a big influence when Peter came back. When Peter rejoined him. And what was your relationship with Taylor like? Uh, Peter made people laugh, you know. <laughs> Peter was funny. People, Peter used to bring players in. He used to do, you know, look, watch players. People like, like most of the players, Peter Taylor would be responsible for bringing into the club. Uh, and Peter's probably, apart from his football, but his biggest asset was making Clough laugh. Mm. Uh, you know, he really did, and he was a funny man, Pete. But he had uh, quite a big input, really. You know, particularly bringing players in. So then things start to take off. You get promoted from the second division. Was that the point at which things really started to change? The belief started well, to build. I think actually I was in Dallas at, when they got promoted. So uh, of course, yes, I was, I was, I was, far, I was far from home, and I was quite surprised when it happened that they actually got promoted. I think it was the last day of the season, 
uh, finished third, I think, to, uh, something like I can't remember, but Bolton had a bad result and they went up. So I was coming back from Dallas for the beginning, like basically for pre season the following season. And a whole new different <laughs> different bowl game altogether, yeah. So this was a loan period in seventy seven, seventy eight to Dallas Tornadoes. Yeah. We made forty appearances scoring fourteen goals. Why were you loaned all the way to Dallas and not to a, a British club? Well, again, it was like experience, the opportunity. Uh, a lad called Alan Hinton, who I used to play with Derby. Yeah. Alan was going to Dallas. Uh, the guy, the coach at Dallas, was over talking to him, and Alan suggested I might, you know, at that stage in my career, might fancy it a little bit. Yeah, so good opportunity, paid me well, uh, great experience, took the family, and had a good time in Dallas. Really good. Was that great? Was hot, very hot, but. Weather was great, yeah. But what a treat! Oh uh, yeah, compared to the what weather a travel here, uh, and the weather in Renton. Um, oh, yeah, was was Dallas the TV show on at that point? Or was that just slightly uh, free? Uh, just about would be a thing. I remember we went to uh, <laughs> it was what, a massive what, TV show. What was that? Uh, name of the big house. I can't remember, but I went there to have a look at it and all that. South you know. Fork, South Fork, South Fork. That's it. We went there to have a look. But <laughs> it was, it was, it was, <laughs> so when did I go to seventy seven and seventy eight? I went to Dallas. So wow. it'd be around about that time. Must yeah. be great. Yeah, but they weren't filming that when I went. You know, I didn't see any of the uh, the guys there. Yeah. You didn't get a cameo. Uh, then, <laughs> yeah, I even forgot the names. You know, one of my first crushes, Pam. Really? Yeah, I like Pam. So you come back from Dallas. Did by the way, just before while we're on that, did you ever get? Did you ever have spells playing in weird and wonderful lands in, in younger years? Preston, Carlisle. <laughs> <laughs> but like you never do like a pre-season tournament in China or anywhere like that. We went out to Singapore. Which wow! Was great. Yeah, that was really good. Um, With Forrest, it was just before Stan left actually. So I was coming through. I remember playing a couple of games alongside him, which was which sort of ninety-five. Great. Um, around there, yeah, yeah. And what was that like? It was unbelievable. We got, it was like being in the Beatles. It was like camping. Only out four of you, you made it. You were. There was only four of you who made it. <laughs> yeah. But we, I remember us staying in this hotel that was um, cylindrical, and you could look over the overlook the balconies down, um, like the Guggenheim. Yes. And uh, they were just all camped out. Twenty four. You could come out of your bedroom at three o'clock in the morning, look down. There'd be two hundred forest fans. Forest fans with uh, teddy bears, Mickey Mouse things. Used to chase the bus as we as we left. Remember me, Scott, wow. and Stan getting chased out of a um, uh, a shopping mall. And are these, are these shopping centre? Sorry, that's okay. Malls, malls, we'll, we'll accept more. Were they people from Singapore or forest fans? Or these forest fans that travelled to Singapore? Oh no, 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 Singaporean forest fans. It's great. That's so cool. Yeah. And then we had two weeks in Australia. And were there, was was it mainly there as well? No. Did you ever experience that sort of mania, John? I'm thinking, I suppose, of the open top bus tours must have been amazing when you're winning stuff and you're having the civic receptions in Market Square and the whole city's turned out for these big events. Do you remember getting swamped much or, or, or approached in town? So long ago, I mean, I've never lived in Nottingham, so I've been mean, coming to Nottingham quite a lot more than my wife. If she wants to go shopping, we go to Nottingham. Uh, but not that much, really. But I remember, the, obviously, the good nights, the European Cup things were like just amazing. Uh, the number of people who turned out, uh, I just don't think there's that many people that, that interested. Obviously, you've got your uh, 30,000, 40,000 football fans, but it's the whole community, really. It's every, almost everybody in Nottingham's out, yeah. So it's it amazing. Great, great line in the film when Larry Lloyd says, I didn't know there were this many people in Nottingham. Oh, exactly, yeah, that's what, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And I don't think there were, actually. I think the people no, they probably come, come from, from, yeah, East Singapore. Sweden, like, every, yeah, so yeah, yeah. All these other yeah, lots of places, yeah. Not many from Derby, though. Yeah. Preston, Carlisle. Yeah. Um, one of your... Um, highlight, maybe, isn't the right word. Notorious moments as a Forest player is in the 1978 League Cup final replay. Yeah, yeah, people mention it quite a lot. When Phil Thompson uh, trips you, either outside the box or inside the box, the referee gives a penalty, yeah. which is scored, and uh, and uh, the Forest win the Cup in the replay. The cameras do seem to show that you were perhaps not necessarily... Uh, 100% inside the box. Uh, I think that's 100%, not almost. <laughs> Do you remember exactly where you were when you were tripped by Thompson? Yeah, yeah. And I've got to say, at the time, I thought it was a penalty. <laughs> I really did, you know, because you sort of broke from... We were defending a corner, and I broke from the edge of our box. I like some people think you must have got a taxi, you know. <laughs> but how I got there, just, like, one, that was wonder. How did I think about that? Me getting from one edge of box to the other box... Uh, pretty quick. Uh, Tony Woodcock broke down the left and he played it inside to me and uh, so I was just through on goal, just going to ram it home. 
uh, when Phil Thompson tripped me up. A clear foul, obviously. There's no complaint. No, no, no clear, clear foul. Uh, but the debate was, was it in the box or not? And at the time, I thought it was a penalty. Uh, but it wasn't. It was probably about a foot, two foot outside the box. Yeah. But and people say, oh, you know, dive. I certainly never dived. I never dived in my life, I can say that. But if you're running that way and somebody trips you up, it's very hard to fall the other way. <laughs> so was, I, mean, I mean, it really is. It's impossible. Yeah. So mom momentum, took, <laughs> momentum took me in the box. And uh, we, we were, it was a bit fortunate with VAR or whatever it would be today, it would have been a penalty if it was VAR. But the referee, remember, was from Middlesbrough, uh, Cloughy's hometown as well. So maybe he felt, oh, we'll give him a penalty. <laughs> A guy called Pat Partridge was referee. There's two great interviews after that uh, cup final, which are Phil Thompson and Peter Taylor. And Phil Thompson says, I did, I tripped him. He goes, it was a yeah, professional yeah. foul, I had to bring him down. This, he doesn't even pretend that he hasn't done it, yeah. he goes, but it was outside the box. He's sort of trying to get credit for being honest about the fact yeah, that, that he was down. And then there's a great clip of Peter Taylor in the forest dressing room with John Robertson. Uh, and he, get, he says to Robbo, because the guy's interviewing him, saying, it's... He was he's saying he was outside the box. He goes, well, he saw it. He says, and John Robson goes, hey, he was, he was inside the box, I saw it. And the, the, the interviewer says, well, the camera show, Peter, that uh, actually was outside the box. And he takes a quick drag on his cigar and goes, well, no doubt your camera show that we've won the cup or not. And that's it. And it's so cool. And it's such a great, ballsy yeah, response. Was, he was the pretty sharp. Room. Yeah, he was sharp. It's yeah. such a great answer. And it, obviously, that's the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The debate. Um, we had a lot of people emailing and, and tweeting us uh, when we announced that you were coming on. A lot of people uh, with questions they would like to put to you. And, uh, as you can imagine, this was quite a popular uh, question, uh, but Justin O'Hanlon was the first one to tweet it. He said, did you say anything to Phil Thompson after you'd won that penalty? Uh, not at the time, no, but I've, I have met him a couple of times since. Uh, and we're fine now, yeah, but the first time... Uh, I really seen him was at Sheffield United, I think it was. It was when I was working for Martin O'Neill scouting. He always used to nip out like five, ten minutes before the end of the game. So going down the stairs at Sheffield United and he's about five stairs in front of me. He just turns around and notices me. He just and said, you cheating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I could only, what can I say, just F off big nose. That's <laughs> that, that is the only thing I can think of, you know. But I suppose... You weren't cheating, because no, he did no, I, wasn't, I wasn't cheating, no, but he, 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 did, he did call me a cheating yeah. But then in, in time, that relationship has... Uh, yeah, but, yeah I have seen him since I spent, and he's actually a pretty nice guy, yeah, you know, he's a decent lad, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've spoken to him since, but there was never any animosity, I don't think, really, just one of those things. He'd, uh, we, we got a bit of luck uh, with the penalty being given. Uh, you, you play in the 1980 European Cup final you get brought on as a sub in the 67th minute um, when you start that day on the bench uh, firstly how hard is it to be on the bench during a game like that? Uh, in a game like that uh, I got quite used to it, actually being on the bench <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I know the feeling <laughs> well, I, was, I was pretty comfortable on the bench really you know and you always think I'll be ready you know and, uh, but then when it happened, I've got to say, I remember like, I'm like 34, 35 at this time, like they're just right at the end. And uh, don't panic, don't do anything silly. Oh, wow. You know, yeah, 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 I was really nervous about it. I've That's got to say, I wasn't really, uh, I, I got quite nervous because we're one nil up. And I think if anything goes wrong now, I'll get the blame. <laughs> but uh, we managed to hang on, I got a few decent touches and uh, it, was, it was okay. But I, it was a bit nerve wracking, really. But to be on the pitch at the end of that game, where Forrest have retained the European Cup, was it a feeling of relief when the final whistle went? How much do you remember about that day and about those moments? Uh, mostly relief, yeah, yeah, at the end of it, yeah. 1-0, Hamburg had sort of, uh, you know, had quite a lot of the ball and we defended well. Uh, so to come out with a 1-0 was a really, really good result. Amazing, really. Uh, the day was fine. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty experienced. I'm used to this thing. And... You know, there was a couple of days before I thought I might be playing, uh, but I wasn't, so, OK, I'm on the bench. Uh, so I'm pretty relaxed about it, yeah. I was, like, I was, I was pretty relaxed about football generally, <laughs> though, to be honest with you. That's so I, good, though. I never used to really get, uh, but that was as nervous as I've ever been, I think, going on as a substitute for those uh, last 
20, 30 minutes. It's kind of thankless, isn't it, going on as a substitute yeah. 1-0 up? If it goes wrong, Paul, you, like know, if, if, if it, you know, and you like, what, let one go into your foot or something, or you missed, yeah. It's uh, yeah, a bit worrying, really, yeah. God, I, I never thought of it like that. I just thought you'd be itching to get on and do something and prove yourself rather than... The, I suppose the, the the pressure, the enormity of it, weighing on yeah, you. Yeah, I've got. I was a bit. I was quite nervous at the time. Yeah, I remember it took me a minute or two. You know, once you've had a couple of touches and that yeah. things, it's okay. But uh, until then, it's, I was really nervous. Yeah, and getting your second win. That's the. You know, when people are playing the game and uh, just getting to the pace of the game is. The, you know, it's not that easy. I used to find that as well. You'd come on. 15, 10 minutes and they're expecting you to just run yourself yeah, ragged yeah. so you sprint for 15 or 10 minutes yeah, yeah, it's, and you come off like <gasps> yeah, you, you, you can't get like, oh, you've been on yeah. 15 minutes what's up with you and yeah. you've broken because you've sprinted for 15 yeah. minutes because you're the one that's having to chase in the corners yeah, yeah you can't get your breath it was, yeah, it was okay. yeah we had a lot of questions come in uh, through the internet um, one that particularly uh, as, as I can't wait to hear the answer to this <laughs> Michael Lang says Ask him about when he met Pele in the service station. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what happened and where well, was uh, it? Well, it was at Toddington Services. Of course it was. <laughs> Where everybody thought Paul knows it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'd been at Sheffield United a few weeks before watching a game. And I, I read where Pele was going to be in the UK. It was Sheffield FC, who are the oldest club in England. It was their 150th anniversary, I think. So Pele was coming over for that dinner. So, uh, and I knew that anyway, so I'm going down, I used to do some chauffeur driving, for, taxi driving, chauffeur driving, for a friend of mine who used to do a lot of Rolls Royce, Toyota work, so I'm taking two Toyota lads down to Heathrow, the guy's about mid-thirties, that sort of age, you know, so we stop at Toddington, and I've gone to the toilet there around WH Smith or somewhere, and as I'm coming out, Pelly's walking in the toilet with his guys looking after him, and I don't know whether to speak to him, because I'd met him in America, uh, when he played for New York, a, a guy called uh, Kenny Cooper was our goalkeeper at Dallas, and he used to do the Dr. Pepper adverts with Pele. <laughs> so I'd actually been in Pele's yeah. company uh, having a drink after the games and that. Anyway, so, no, nah, and he didn't recognise me, you know, and I was a bit disappointed, really. <laughs> but so I've gone out and uh, get to these guys. I said, look, that's like, Pele's just gone in the toilet. You know, maybe you might want to get his autograph, you know. And the first one said to me, is he the one who did the handball? Oh my God! Yeah, and the other guy said, "Who's Pele?" That's two oh. guys between the age of thirty and forty. Oh my God! I remember. Um, you ever so met a footballer in services? I, I, I'm trying to think <laughs> if I've ever met a footballer. The in toilets of a football services. Well, well, but I was there one day when the Kidderminster team came in as well. <laughs> So that was quite good. <laughs> it's not quite as good as Pele <laughs> <laughs> coming in. I met Lars Bohinen in the Victoria Centre once. And I met Steve Stone in Hockley. I just this has to... got legs. Um, Matthew Speddings has uh, got in touch. He said, uh, I bumped into an old teammate of John's in a hotel bar in Seattle a couple of years ago, Alan Hinton. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, he said, I work a lot for BBC Sport Football Focus. Um... I asked Mark Lawrenson if he remembered Alan, and he said, Alan Hinton, white boots. Although a Wednesday supporter, I'm a big fan of Cluffy's Forest, especially John Zera. Does John think in our modern game there's anything a manager could learn from Brian's style of management, or has the game moved on too much? If that's a rubbish question, just talk about Alan Hinton, he says. <laughs> well, Alan was like, uh, two great feet, great crossover ball. Uh, he was accused of not being the bravest, but you know he got, he got in good situations, and he crossed balls like, with either foot when people are, you know, coming in at him, so he was brave enough. The managing, uh, be a lot different now. So much involved in football now, you know, I just can't imagine Cluffy being into the stats and he's, you know, I just can't imagine him being like that. His philosophy was like, keep the game simple. The game is simple. You know, you do what you're good at. That's You're here because you can do that. And you might not be able to head it, like Larry Lloyd, you might not be as good in the air, but try and head it like Larry Lloyd, you know, keep just, do what you're good at. But uh, as far as moving players around and systems, I mean, if you go back to the second European Cup final, they played 4-5-1. Uh, if people really look at that, he played Gary Bittles up yes. front in his own. Uh, so, you know, about 3-5-2, 4-4-4, you know, so there are all these sort of systems now. But it was, it was football-wise and he kept it simple. Um... This question from Timothy, um, well, I'm interested to uh, uh, let's put this to both of you. Um, he said, hi, legends. Hi, Timothy. 
Uh, Mr. O'Hare, have you or any other of your acolytes ever played a match hammered? Thanks, Tim, in the South of France, 40 years supporting. Come on, you Reds. Have you ever played a game hammered? Not quite. <laughs> not quite hammered but, or not quite uh, played? Well, I'll give you like one occasion when we're in Van- when we're in Vancouver. The last uh, sorry, last game, uh, home game, was against Shamrock Rovers, <laughs> and I, I didn't think it was going to be played. They're on the bench, so most of the young lads who were you know, not playing. I had a few beers on the afternoon of the game and then we get to the ground and uh, I'm on the subs bench again. <laughs> but I didn't think I'd be playing, so I've had a drink and we're going home like in a couple of days, so it's the last, you know, the final yeah. final fling sort of thing, you know. So I get changed, go out on the pitch before the game and, like, clown around, you know, half <laughs> really, you know. So, uh, so the manager, Ian McCall, wasn't too happy about that. Mm-hmm. I might have had... Uh, uh, sort of some like the fact that he got rid of me fairly soon <laughs> might have had something to do with that you know the fact he wanted to get rid of me so uh, and then I remember strange enough at Forest I mean I, I Cluffy liked to have a drink yeah. and uh, we played at Azure Pitesh Pitesh in uh, Romania and uh, so I always just have a couple of drinks tonight before the game got a couple of beers and they were all the lads together and the beer wasn't very nice, so I burned it, couldn't really drink it, didn't taste nice. So I had like, well, well I'll drink that, I'll drink yours. <laughs> so I probably had maybe four or five pints again. I'm going to be on the bench, you know. <laughs> so I start, I'm playing. Oh I'm playing, my I played sort of wide right, and the, which uh, <laughs> wide right wasn't really my position anyway, so I was a bit of a Subutio player out there, you know. <laughs> anyway, I can remember at half time, and the only time in my life I've, I've uh, faked. I went and said to Jimmy Gordon, Jimmy, my hamstring's giving me some trouble. <laughs> Honestly, you know, my hamstring's ready to go and like, I never run quick enough to pull a hamstring. Uh, Paul, you brought in something very special, which will suit our new televisual videoed um, medium. I'm always asking you about your shirts and what you kept and what you didn't keep. You've got a bag of shirts that you haven't delved into. No, I've not looked at them because... I oh, thought, I can't wait was, for this because it was your birthday the other day. Yeah, I thought, well, I'll I'll delve into that because literally like that oh, in the back man. of my wardrobe, and I don't, I genuinely don't know what's in there. Oh and, man, I don't know. It might it might be Plymouth oh, or uh, hope not Northampton shirts, but it could be Forest. Could be Forest. Hopefully, be Forest. Can, can we open it? Uh, yeah, go for it. Happy to bring them out. Should I bring them out? No, you bring them out. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Oh, Johnny's show it right. Oh my god, <laughs> right. I, I'm going to try and not look. Okay. Oh. Oh. oh my god, it's a Bayern Munich show! <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> That's something you wait for cup quarter final, nineteen ninety six. It's so clean. He's such a dweeb, isn't he? Do you Oh my god! Clean, efficient. That's just brilliant. Oh my god! <laughs> Match warm. <laughs> oh, Johnny, have a look at that. Okay, the next one out. Oh my god! It's so... Oh my! Oh wow! Oh, that one's actually mid nineties. It's not got a shirt on the back. We um we played we played United pre oh. in a pre season fem- The Umber International. That's that the- a- that's Beckham's shirt. No. Oh, oh my god. That was the one that they swapped. So uh, they, they had that awful grey yeah. away kit. They blamed the Southampton. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they couldn't have worn it for very long. Though. So we all played on the City ground a pre season friendly. Boiling. Ajax. That's it. Yeah. And oh, Man United. Man. Summer of ninety five. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, Beckham! What, I mean, it looks very the, big as well. It was the nineties. Have you seen Oasis? <laughs> looks like a bit big from Beckham. Right? Yeah, What's the yeah, next yeah. one out? Right, God, it might be Oxera. Right? Oh mate, this must have been. This was ninety six, ninety seven. That would be ninety six. Yeah. This is ninety six, ninety seven. It's the relegation season. This is the one where um, Frank Clark goes psycho as player manager towards the end of the Arsenal game that we win. Two goals from Alfie Inga Haaland. Ian Wright was dismissed for an elbow on Nikola Jurka. <laughs> oh my God, look at that. And you know what I love about it? As a fan, I'd buy these shirts. You, I always noticed that the, they were different, the ones that the players wore. And one way you could tell they were different was the shape of the tree was just slightly rounder. Oh, okay. Can you notice mm, that? Yeah, it's a bit yeah, bulky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, can I put it on? Yeah. Or is, is it not okay to put No, it? it's fine. I'm going to have to wash them all after you've Look at exuded. That. Look at that. Can That's you still buy Labatt's? Paul McGregor in the Premier League. <laughs> you still buy... Can you still buy Labatt's? Oh, I don't is know, it? actually. Oh, the lot. And look at that as well. Embossed <laughs> rather than just mm. printed on. Oh, good <laughs> grief. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll just turn it away. Oh, <laughs> Christ. Oh, man. I'm wearing a shirt that was worn by Paul McGregor in the Premier League for four... Ooh. <laughs> they weren't that baggy in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my god, look at 
Oh, it's not bad. That's not bad. That is a thing of you. Fits you better. The last time we were in the Premier League. Okay, just the last few questions, John. I'm sorry yeah. the way this has gone. Very <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excited, yeah, really. Oh, yeah, God, yeah. But this is magic. This is like I don't know how you describe it. It's like wearing polyester. Mm. It's like the Turing shroud. <laughs> it's like you're wearing something that's touched like <laughs> celestial greatness. Wow. It's part of the show where we ask footballers the sort of questions you used to get asked in football magazines and annuals are the sort of fact file questions. Mm. Uh, so John O'Hare, what's your favourite film? Sound of Music. Oh, Ooh, interesting. Um, do you have I mean, any... No, 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 West Side Story, that was another. West Side Story would be, yeah, there are two that, yeah. So yeah. two good solid Pretty musicals. Old, yeah, yeah. I've not been to the cinema for a, a long time. Um, well, if you like musicals, Mamma Mia 2, I think. Yeah, it's supposed to be really good, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you have any phobias? <laughs> no. Nothing at all? Not at all. No, no, no. Not no. scared of anything? Not frightened of anything, no. Who's your favourite band or musical artist? Uh, Beatles have always been my favourite. Always will, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like quite a lot of music, but older stuff, I'm not really into modern. Uh, I don't know why you looked at me then. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, uh, that, that era, the Beatles era, quite a lot, you know, a few groups, but the Beatles were... Uh, Rolling Stones also were really... Proper rock. I was a Beatles man, yeah. 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 So you're not, you're not getting any time for Little Mix or do a Lip or anything like that? Mm, no. I've heard of Little Mix, but I thought they were like sweets or something like that. <laughs> 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 um, what's your favourite food? Quite, oh, quite a lot, really. There's, there's not much that I don't like. Uh, but I like, I'm pretty keen on pasta. I can eat pasta oh, good. most days, yeah. But there's very little I don't like. When I was in America, quite so I, I quite like liver. A lot of people don't like liver. Oh, it reminds me of Jack but, Duckworth. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot, yeah. <laughs> and liver, it was the most delicious liver in America, and it used to be about a dollar a hundred weight. You know, they, when you go yeah. to can have liver, they think it's for the dog. They don't really think that human beings eat liver <laughs> in America, honestly. So if you buy liver in America, people just assume it's for your dog. It's so but it was really, really wow. nice liver. So liver, yeah. bacon, and onions in gravy. Yeah, 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 yeah. My mum used to make it. It was never, it was never my cup of tea. The, the texture of it. Mm, I just, I just really like it. Yeah, but the pasta and uh, a nice fillet steak, are another thing. But yeah, oh, but go, I'm going. Back. I haven't had one of them for a while. <laughs> um, who is your best dressed Forest teammate? Oh, best dressed. Uh, wasn't Robbo. <laughs> uh, smoothest, best dressed. Bittles was probably the smoothest, uh, 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 but it was, his dress was a bit way out, Gary's. Uh, uh, but individual, it was individual. Uh, he loves a flowery shirt, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he does. Uh, He's yeah. still quite dapper. Mm. That's that's a couple of, I like uh, Woodcock and Anderson. Viv was a smart guy. Viv and ah, Tony, yes. two, the two, young, yeah, two of the young lads, like, were probably. Uh, yeah, they'd be about the smartest guys, really. What's your favourite drink? <sighs> For 50 years it was lager, <laughs> but I'm now a beer man. Uh, proper oh, so ale man. ale? Proper ale man now, yeah. For about the last three years. Yeah, I've gone that way. Yeah, I'm, Hipster. Uh, oh, are you into the sort of craft stuff? Or oh, yeah, the, uh, proper, yeah, the proper ales, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So it's, uh, the local pub I go in, have like quite a few different, you know, every week they've got different beers in, so I like to try them. Some... Uh, I'm not that good, some are. Some are quite strong. I remember having four pints one night and like going out and I could hardly stand up and I can drink four pints generally quite easy. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't realise it was so strong. Do you like a pale or a darker one? I like a paler one, yeah. yeah like, like IPA, yeah. IPA stuff, yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, I've never... I drunk lager for many, many... 50 years, or about, I suppose, really. There's quite a few um, pale ale... St- kind of lager, sort yeah. of a, a lager, hoppy lager crossover yeah, yeah. thing that's happening. Well, at the minute, like the Nickel. bottled beer, there's uh, Goose Island, which I yeah. think is really, really oh, nice. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah, I really yeah. like Hunkers. that. That's, yes, that'd be my favourite. Apart from that, if I was having a beer at home, I'd go to and buy some Goose Island. I've got so I just bought some at the weekend. Well, very nice. So if I have a drink at home, it'd be a Goose Island, yeah. I like the Shepherd's Neem Pale Ale. Yes, yes. You get from Asda. Oh, it's so nice. 6.4, it's Lovely. 6.4? Well, that's, yeah, that's, I, th- I think the Goose Island's about 5.5. 5, uh, it's it's got to have a decent alcohol. Yeah. 6.4, I mean, that's bordering that's, on that's strong, Oh, I need yeah. it. I, yeah. need, yeah. I really it's need like it. It's like Bucky. Carlin. I like Carlin. Carlin. Johnny Owen loves Bucky, Carlin. Yeah, right. I've had a plenty Fully of that. assimilated yeah. into being an Englishman. Yeah. Carlin. Um, and the final question. What's your favourite item of clothing? 
I've got a sports jacket, a Dax, that I've had, oh, for, nice. I've had for years. It's still in the wardrobe, and I wore it uh, probably less than 12 months ago. I had a night out in Nottingham uh, with Rob O'Shamus. It was Seamus McDonough's, like it was a birthday party for one of the girls or the grand, anyway, whatever it was. And I wore it, that, and like Seamus thought, whoa, where did you get that? I've, I've had it 15 years or something like that. And I said, well, I don't really want to get rid of it. And Robbo said, Robbo says, if I were you, I would get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> but Robbo said that. You can hear it. Like, it's, like, I've had it, it's just a jacket. You've got to have the right trousers with it and all that. You know, it's, it's just a uh, dyke sport jacket. Checky, small checky. And yeah. It's pretty old fashioned now, I think, really, you know. But it's still in the wardrobe and I still like it. John, it's been an absolute honour having you on the show today. Thank you so Pleasure. much for coming yeah. in. Thank you. Nice man. to be here. Thank yeah, you. Nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. He's here. He's, He's there. there. He's every <laughs> way. He's John away. John away. He's here. He's there. He's every <laughs> way. John away. John away. <laughs>